Welcome to everyone uh, to this uh, webcast uh, on the future of health services research, advancing health systems research and practice in the United States. Uh, today, we're going to hear from leading experts responsible for using, producing, and funding health services research about the, and about the future directions for this critical field of uh, research. Uh, I'm Michael McGinnis uh, uh, at the National Academy of Medicine. It's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's conversation. Uh, the discussion builds on a recently released uh, National Academy of Medicine special publication about the future of health services research, which was based on a symposium convened on February 26th and 7th, uh, 2018. Uh, the full publication is actually available free of charge on the NAM website at nam.edu backslash HSR. If I could go uh, uh, to the next slide, uh, that's me, next slide <laughs> to, to the uh, agenda. Uh, we'll first uh, going to hear an overview of the field of health services research from Carolyn Clancy of the Veterans Health Administration. Uh, Carolyn served as the Deputy Undersecretary for Discovery Education and Affiliate Networks. Prior to her current she served as the Deputy Undersecretary for Health for Organizational Excellence, overseeing VHA's performance, quality, safety, risk management, systems engineering, auditing, oversight, ethics, and accreditation programs. If that sounds like everything, it pretty much is. She uh, actually just prior to this position was the executive in charge at the Veterans uh, uh, Administration overseeing uh, $68 billion in uh, programs and 9 million uh, beneficiaries. Uh, so Carolyn, we're, uh, we're very pleased to have you, uh, not only because of that, but also because you served for 10 years as the director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, I'm going to run through the various uh, presenters and then uh, turn it uh, to Carolyn to uh, kick things off. Uh, after uh, Carolyn, we'll hear from Lisa Simpson, uh, the head of Academy Health, who will provide an overview of the key themes from the symposium and the resulting NAM publication. I should mention uh, and underscore the fact that uh, Lisa was substantially responsible for the uh, implementation of this activity. Uh, she suggested it and uh, partnered with a number of key organizations and individuals to ensure that it happened. Uh, Lisa has been the president and chief executive officer of Academy Health since 2011. Before joining Academy Health, Dr. Simpson spent eight years as professor of pediatrics uh, as an endowed chair in he child health policy at the University of South Florida, and then as the director of child policy research uh, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and the University of Cincinnati. She served uh, earlier as the Deputy Director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality from 1996 to 2002. So we have two individuals to lead us off who have been key uh, leaders in health services research uh, for the last uh, nearly three decades in one fashion or another. Following um, Dr. Simpson's overview, we'll turn to a reactor panel of experts that, that represent different key stakeholder groups who will share their perspective on the key priority uh, for the field of uh, health services research over the next decade and their, uh, their perspectives on necessary action steps for moving the field forward uh, and achieving the priority uh, that the field certainly deserves. Uh, we have on that panel uh, Dr. Joe Selby. Joe is the Executive Director of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. He's a family physician, a clinical epidemiologist and health services researcher with more than 35 years of experience in patient care, research and administration, including uh, vital leadership uh, shaping uh, uh, Kaiser Permanente's very strong capacity in that respect and um, leading to a number of breakthrough insights uh, and methodologic uh, advances in the field. Uh, in addition to Joe on the panel, we have uh, Gopal Khanna, uh, who is the director, the current director of the Agency for uh, Healthcare Research and Quality. He's been appointed to, to that position in, in May 2017. Uh, so ARC is very well represented on this panel. Uh, and um, the ARC, as most of you know, uh, has the mission of producing evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable, 
and works as the key agency in that respect in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and with other uh, federal, state, and local partners to make sure that evidence is understood and used. The mission of ensuring that healthcare in America is based on evidence. Tim Ferriss is a practicing primary care physician and CEO of Massachusetts General Physicians Organization, which is the largest of Harvard Medical School's faculty physician groups. Uh, as Senior Vice President for Population Health and Partners previously, um, Tim led the design uh, and implementation of system-wide uh, care delivery changes to improve patient health, reducing of the health care cost burden, and also was a key member of the National Academy of Medicine's uh, consensus study uh, committee on uh, vital signs. Mary Applegate uh, serves as the medical director for the Ohio Department of Medicaid and is responsible for implementing uh, the Medicaid quality strategy. Uh, uh, to improve health outcomes across the state. She's double boarded in pediatrics and internal medicine and has been in rural primary care practice for over 30 years, still caring to this day for newborns and mothers in her region. And our final panelist is Eleanor Perfetto, uh, who is the Senior Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for the National Health Council. Uh, she uh, holds a part-time faculty appointment as well at the University of Maryland Baltimore School of Pharmacy, where she's Professor of Pharmaceutical Health Services Research. Her research and policy work uh, primarily focuses on care quality, patient engagement, and comparative effectiveness, and patient-centered outcomes research. This is a really stellar group of folks, all of whom are important uh, to the uh, uh, leadership in the field and also the development of the NAM special publication. The last part of the uh, webinar will be reserved for questions and answers. Uh, while the presentations are going on, if you have a question for the speakers, uh, please type that question into the Q&A box on the webinar platform. And during the Q&A session, uh, Danielle Witcher, who is the Senior Program Officer uh, uh, here in the National Academy of Medicine responsible for the project, will read the questions for the speakers to respond to. Uh, uh, I should note in advance that we'll have to be judicious in our choice because this is a record-setting uh, attendance uh, for the uh, uh, National Academy of Web Medicine webcast with over a thousand participants. We're delighted that you've joined and looking forward to your input uh, both now and after the um, and, and after the webinar. Before turning things over to Carolyn, I want to extend a special thanks uh, to the following organizations uh, for their support and leadership throughout the process. Academy Health, uh, I already mentioned, was led, is led by uh, Lisa Simpson, the American Association of Colleges and, and Nursing, the American Board of Family Medicine, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the Federation of American Hospitals, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, all of these organizations have been uh, key to the implementation of the meeting and the uh, execution of the publication uh, with their support and advice along the way. I'd also like to thank the uh, members of the, uh, of the planning committee, uh, Andrew Beinman, Carolyn Clancy, Ellie De 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 Dehoney, uh, Adeze Nweki, uh, Lee Fleischer, Sherry Gleed, Atul Grover, Sandra Hernandez, Chip Khan, Gopal Khanna, Suzanne Miyamoto, Bob Phillips, Alonzo Plow, Joe Selby, and Lisa Simpson, as well as the uh, NAM uh, uh, staff who have been involved, and also the uh, Academy Health staff who were involved in the effort. So thanks to all for your leadership in this effort. And um, as I turn the agenda over to Carolyn, I'll note uh, that um, for the uh, Carolyn will speak for 10 minutes, Lisa will speak for 10 minutes, and the panel uh, discussion will then uh, go on until 2.05, and then we'll move to questions and answers at that point. So we have a fairly tight time frame. Again, thanks to all for your participation. Carolyn, let me turn the floor over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Michael. Um, I want to thank everyone for taking part in this webinar to highlight the National Academy of Medicine's special publication on the future of health services research. I'm quite honored to join my colleagues today 
And I have to say, I've had a long-standing interest in health services research, uh, having spent most of my career working to improve quality of safety and health care provided in this country. When I was at ARC for uh, many years and director for over 10, I learned a lot about measuring patient outcomes, developing practice guidelines, and systematically reviewing evidence. And it gave me the opportunity as well to work with large databases to get um, a picture of what primary care practice looked like in this country. But most importantly, it gave me a very clear-eyed view of what it would take to um, actually get with the people who would use evidence-based information to improve care, to crystallize and distill the most important questions, and to figure out how to collaborate with them to make the output such that they could put it into practice. Knowledge for its own sake, as it says on every National Academy publication, is not enough. It's not enough to know we must do. So I want to share just a brief overview of HSR, which is uh, decidedly um, my own opinion or informed by my own biases. Um, I think there's broad agreement that the field uh, really emerged in the mid-60s, more or less concurrent with the de passage and then uh, implementation of Medicare and Medicaid. Suddenly, huge expenditures and investments in uh, health care from the federal budget. And with that, many questions about what are we getting in return for our substantial investments. Uh, fast forward to today, and we would say HSR is a multidisciplinary field of scientific investigation that studies how multiple factors um, affect access, quality, and cost of health care which I usually shorten to say what works for which patients, under which circumstances, and why. Um, those are the big questions. I predict that in the coming couple of years, we're going to continue to have big debates about the role of government in healthcare, and frankly, what is the policy goal. Some of you may have seen Sherry Gleed's uh, blog posted uh, yesterday on health affairs, which I thought was uh, a really terrific example of that. So just to talk about some specific topics. Uh, one, of course, is metrics. Some days it feels like we're report card crazy in this country. Um, but I think that we will see into the future a continued demand for an interest in uh, metrics. So the NAM's uh, report on vital signs was very important. Even better than metrics, though, would be metrics linked with strategies to improve performance. You know, if you're using uh, Google or some other GPS-like tool when you're driving and you take a wrong turn, it reroutes you or lets you know you are really going the wrong way. Um, to really just be in the business of developing evidence-based metrics with great precision to tell people uh, that they already didn't do the best job they could shouldn't be the Everest of our ambitions. Um, and of course, if we're going to use that information, timely feedback is uh, hugely important. A second area, of course, is health IT. Uh, we've been at this for a long time, um, but we're now starting to see as, cheap, as computer power has gotten ever uh, less expensive, the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, deep learning and so forth. Um, we've seen how well, what a vital part this is of improving healthcare at VA for well over 20 years, because our patient record is available to any provider anywhere in the country, which gives us an enormous opportunity to reduce duplication of testing and fragmentation of care, and serves as a very rich source of patient data for investigators. A third area, of course, related to health IT is informatics. Um, and this gets into the issue of how do we take full advantage of uh, large-scale databases derived from electronic health records and other applications to really get a handle on how do we manage the health of populations. And that may mean connecting with other sources of data that have nothing to do with the delivery of healthcare. Um, our biggest aha in this area at VA has actually been developing uh, what I believe is now the nation's largest genomic database where we have um, genomic information from 725,000 veterans also connected to their clinical longitudinal electronic record. But we're going to need a huge amount of 
collaboration to figure out what are the best methods to analyze that, and frankly, which, uh, how should we set priorities in that space? A fourth area is evidence-based practice. Um, it's no surprise that uh, there's, there are continuous debates about uh, the ever-increasing amount of medical data and information and advances in informatics and IT are probably only going to um, accelerate that. Um, trying to figure out how we make it easy for clinicians to have the right information uh, when they need it at the point of care or point of decision making, I think is going to be a continued uh, area of enormous interest. A fifth area is healthcare delivery. A casual observer of health statistics will see that pretty soon um, it'll be really hard to find hospitals or we'll have many fewer of them and they will look very different than hospitals, certainly when I was training. Uh, advances in information and communications technology have made it possible for us to deliver so much care on an ambulatory basis and virtually. And we have a lot of work to do to figure out how to use that technology as wild, wildly, wisely and judiciously um, as possible. So that's just a brief uh, panoply and I know that uh, Lisa from Academy of Health will actually have um, a whole lot uh, more to say since uh, hers is the preeminent organization for this field. I want to just talk a little bit about uh, stakeholders. Investigators in this field come from nursing, political science, epidemiology, public health, medicine, uh, just to name uh, a few. There are a number of federal health agencies, including NIH, ARC, the CDC, CMS, uh, Health Resources and Services Administration, and of course, VA. We have an entire office focused uh, or devoted wholly to health services research, and we have the huge advantage of being able to close the loop because our investigators are embedded in a integrated delivery system. There are also a number of foundations, and I could never, ever forget to mention the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, uh, which has really, uh, I think, pushed the field hard to make sure that patients are part of this equation and process um, at every step of the way. Um, you know, there are so many innovations in improving patient safety and quality that have come out of health services research. Uh, my favorite may be the re-engineered discharge more because of how clever the avatar was that the investigators uh, developed. Um, but there are, that is just one of many, uh, many patient safety initiatives to reduce, uh, for example, catheter related bladder infections in healthcare facilities. Uh, we were able to put that into practice right in VA and saw a decline in these infection rates by about 22%. So, um, huge opportunities, and frankly, I think huge opportunity for uh, important and uh, quantum leaps forward in uh, health of the population in this country. I want to finish my uh, brief remarks by quoting a portion of uh, what's called the modern Hippocratic Oath from Louis Lasagna, the academic dean at the School of Medicine at Tufts. And what he said was, I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk, and I gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are to follow. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart or a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. To me, that oath, or that a reframed Hippocratic oath, is the essence of what health services research is all about. This pledge certainly reminds us why this field is so important uh, and that the outstanding work that our scientists conduct daily is vitally important and it's vitally important to continue our efforts. So again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I am beyond thrilled that so many people have uh, joined this webinar today and very much looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, thanks for your leadership as well, and uh, thanks for sharing that, those wise words uh, from Dr. Lasagna. Uh, and, and in many ways, uh, the fundamental charge of uh, this effort is to ensure that the systemic influences uh, that are brought to bear on patient care 
uh, are allowing that kind of perspective uh, to uh, to prevail. And now to uh, lead us through the themes of uh, the uh, of the publication and the discussion that led to the publication, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Lisa Simpson, uh, who, as I mentioned earlier, was a key driver uh, in the organization of the effort. Lisa. Thank you, Michael. Um, it has been an honor and a pleasure to work with you, Danielle Witcher, and the rest of the NAM team to organize this important workshop and report. Um, I'm also honored, as is Carolyn, to join this distu distinguished panel on today's webinar. And I would point to the slide that I hope everybody can see uh, that I do have a Twitter handle. And uh, I think the more we do as a field of health services research, reaching the broad community, the better. And that's a message that I think um, many of the speakers today will echo. As I think many know, Academy Health is the national professional organization supporting the fields of health. Oh, next slide, please. I forgot to ask Danielle to forward the slide. Thank you. So uh, right now, I just want to set the stage, uh, reminding folks that Academy Health is the national professional organization supporting the fields of health services, research, and policy. And as such, our nearly 4,000 individual and organizational members care deeply about the future of this field, its challenges, its priorities, and its funding. Given the wide gap between what we know works in healthcare and what is actually achieved, strengthening the pillars of the nation's capacity to assess and improve health system performance is absolutely essential. It is therefore ironic that at a time when appreciation has never been higher for both the need and potential from health services research, the political and financial support for its sustainability and growth have been intermittent at best and sometimes under siege. Indeed, in the current policy environment, questions have been raised about the scope, scale, structure, and function of government support for HSR, and as a result, now is a critical time for the field to reflect on its past accomplishments, identify shortfalls, challenges, and future priorities, and investigate ways of organizing to effectively and efficiently address those challenges and priorities. So the workshop was organized to answer several key questions, including what have been the contributions and impact of HSR, building on the comments that Carolyn Clancy started us with. What are the challenges and opportunities for the future, including how is HSR funded, organized, and coordinated? And finally, uh, focusing on the future, what should be the priorities uh, to really drive a 21st century health system? Next slide, please. So first, we were able to hear during the workshop and reflected in the report from many stakeholders who benefit from health services research across the full gamut of policy and private sector and public uh, working to advance uh, healthcare. And their reflections on the impact and sometimes the shortcomings of the field's impact to date. However, this particular effort that we did um, uh, at, with this report and workshop did not allow for systematic assessment of the full impact of the field. And so we are eagerly awaiting the results of work currently underway by the RAND Corporation, which has been contracted by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to provide a fuller assessment of all federally funded health services research since 2012. And that study was requested by Congress. So regardless, however, of the method of assessment, it is clear that federal and non-federal funding for health services research has supported a number of efforts that have had a significant impact on health and healthcare policy and the way health systems operate. That impact is so significant, so much so that today we take some of the field's insights as givens, cost sharing matters, quality and access vary, and health disparities continue to be a pervasive feature of American healthcare. So we know these things, um, but there's a lot of science behind those. And in fact, the report summarizes three uh, main areas where health services research has contributed. So you see here uh, on the slide, the principle, it has been a principal tool. Oh, can you go back a slide, please? A principal tool for determining the performance of health systems, practices, technologies, and strategies. It has, the field has provided important contributions to policy areas such as cost sharing, quality, more recently payment models, and continuing to focus on patient safety. 
And the field has focused not just at the level of large health systems and policy at both the national and state level, and I'm delighted that Dr. Mary Applegate is joining us today uh, because of the importance of both federal and state uh, use of health services research, but also looking at the specific implementation um, of evidence in particular contexts. I think an area where we have more work to do. Um, at the, uh, excuse me, at the workshop, others commented, and I think you'll hear more today, that health services research has been less influential in informing the nuanced management and implementation decisions that health systems face. I think this reflects in part the field's development over time as it moved from its beginnings of documenting and understanding health uh, system performance and, and the reasons for uh, the shortfalls in that uh, quality, safety, and outcomes. And the field is now much more focused on identifying, designing, and testing interventions to actually improve care and outcomes. Next slide, please. So looking at the challenges and opportunities in the field, the workshop and the report cover several aspects. First, the funding. As I noted earlier, this has been challenging. And in fact, uh, the report uh, provides quite a bit of detail on spending trends and uh, funding for health services research and concludes that a very small percent of the total research and development spending in this country across public and private sectors, thanks to work by uh, Moses and colleagues published in 2015, uh, is that it is very small proportion. And if you then compare it to the amount of spending on US healthcare, it is actually um, less than 1%, actually 0.3%. Further, analyses of the database that the Ni National Library of Medicine supports, uh, HSR PROS, shows that the actual number of projects supported by the top funders of both pub uh, top funders in the public and private sector of health services research has dropped from an overall 20%, um, has dropped overall 20% uh, between 20, 2005 and 2011. Total federal funding for the latest year available for health services research is in fiscal year 2017 and across the many agencies does amount to about $2.9 billion. Timeliness is another issue that was identified uh, by the workshop and the report. And of course, we understand that the uh, disconnect, we're very aware of the disconnect between the pace of change and the timeliness demands of policymakers and system leaders and how often traditional research methodologies are not able to respond adequately. And so um, the report underscores the need for efforts to focus on transmission, communication, and implementation, as well as rapid cycle research projects. New tools and technology were also uh, discussed, and really the opportunity uh, to build on recent investments in such a new large data resources, such as PCORnet, data standards, and many other aspects to really help accelerate and expand the types of research that can be done um, across many sites. Of course, uh, the focus on social determinants and bridging the health and social services gap came up repeatedly. It is a keen focus of national health policy, state health policy, and health systems leadership as we move towards more focus on population outcomes and value-based uh, payment. Um, and it really calls for the field to expand beyond um, the focus on uh, just healthcare settings to other areas. The final challenge and opportunity we addressed was the um, issues around data access and uh, data quality, um, recognizing that many of the barriers are actually uh, not technological, but much more sociological. And the issue of aligning uh, regulations, cultural and political climates, um, to really uh, enhance data, address legal challenges, and uh, manage the growth in proprietary data and uh, the many issues that come up around uh, sharing of not just HIPAA uh, data that's collected under HIPAA, but all of the activities um, that we uh, generate as individuals in our daily lives, which are now being uh, capitalized on to better understand health outcomes and healthcare interventions. Next slide, please. So to close, I want to just touch on some of the 10 recommendations that came out of uh, the workshop. Uh, these are you know, really areas that um, are important for the research field to consider as we look forward. Um, I'm just touching on some of the 10, uh, clearly expanding the vision to account for a full range of all the health system forces in play, 
to move from uh, this disconnect between research, enterprise, and care, and policy to advance really uh, an ecosystem of continuous learning and sharing, uh, to foster the development of a data infrastructure for real-time insights, to create really a working network of stakeholders with shared goals and processes um, so that the research that is done is relevant and useful to those stakeholders. And finally, to really emphasize uh, the need for dissemination, communication of the contributions um, and to disseminate those to all the stakeholders, but also uh, our members of Congress who um, need to understand just what significant need and impact there is from health services research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa, uh, for a, a really splendid uh, overview of uh, the discussion and the publication. And uh, you captured uh, the potential as well as the challenges very clearly. We now turn to a reactor panel of experts uh, from different stakeholder groups, uh, all of whom have been uh, and are leaders in health services research and health systems research. Uh, and each of them will take uh, up to five minutes uh, to give a sense of their uh, of the key priorities uh, moving forward over the next decade. And we're going to begin with uh, Joe Selby. Joe? Yes, uh, if you can hear me, thank you very much, Michael. Thanks uh, to the National Academy of Medicine and to Academy Health for the invitation to be on this um, uh, webinar today. Um, and thanks to everybody who joined us. It's exciting to be able to talk to so many people in this field. Carolyn and Lisa really laid out um, a lot of what we as panelists are going to be expanding on and really gave you a great uh, description of what was covered at the meeting. We were each asked to comment on a couple key points from the meeting and from the report. There are so darn many good points and issues in the report that it was difficult to select two. We counseled with each other and exchanged emails. And I'll just say before I start with my two that you're going to hear from others about the critical importance of getting the questions right for the end users, that is the decision makers, of engaging patients and, and systems leaders in your research toward that end of getting the questions right and getting them disseminated, of considering the entire spectrum of research from maybe uh, clinical research on, on one hand through health services research to um, uh, public health epidemiology and public health involving the community and the, uh, studying the social determinants of health as major parts of the clinical and health services milieu, and of the importance of, uh, of data, uh, now that we have so much of it, that, uh, of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and the role it's gonna play in targeting um, healthcare uh, more precisely towards people who can benefit from it, and hopefully uh, in the process, addressing disparities along the way. So you'll hear uh, bits from that from the other panelists. I'm going to focus on two. The first one is, if it's important to engage patients, and, and it obviously is, it was clear at the meeting, and you'll hear more about it from other panelists today, it is at least as important and maybe more challenging to engage frontline clinicians in health services research, in any kind of research. In most settings, uh, it's um, um, difficult to get their attention because in most sense, in most settings, clinicians, whether they're nurses or pharmacists or physicians or others, um, are under intense time pressures. And yet it is so essential to get to getting the questions right, certainly to getting the results listened to and implemented. And my theory is that it's important for uh, workforce burnout in the part of the clinicians too. So um, I would just say that uh, from the perspective of health services researchers, thinking about getting clinicians involved in your research, be that frontline clinicians in the institutions where you work or in allied and community-based institutions, be that clinician organizations, critically important. Possible approaches, we as funders can require clinician engagement in funding opportunities that we post uh, and in the research projects that come from this, those. We can sponsor training grants like we, like PCORI and ARC have sponsored together to train system-based clinicians as researchers. In turn, I would hope that these trainees could take up the challenge of getting their colleagues within the healthcare systems more involved in asking and answering questions. 
we can define health uh, learning health systems a little more precisely to be just those systems that make time to engage clinicians in relevant research. And we, as well as you, the researchers, can um, work with professional organizations to elevate the role of research among their frontline members. Um, Eleanor Perfetto on this panel reminded me this morning that PCORI has uh, an award to the Association of Black Cardiologists and the National Health Council, and they together are recruiting and training uh, frontline um, uh, cardiologists from this organization to learn about and conduct PCOR and to bring their own patients into the PCOR process. So that could be done. I understand now from our engagement people that we have about five of these awards to different clinician organizations to bring their members into research. But I can't overemphasize how weird it is that we're all doing research. We may be talking to patients, we may be talking to system leaders, but if we're not involving those frontline physicians, I think we're gonna find some hurdles in getting the research listened to and incorporated. So now I'll go on to the second one and it's completely different. I'm gonna urge you to do something that health services researchers have been doing since I would say probably the mid 60s as Carolyn started, pointed out when uh, Medicare and Medicaid started and to continue addressing questions of payment and payment perform. At PCORI, and you heard Carolyn talk about at the VA, we keep generating new evidence on how we can decrease waste, inappropriate care, inappropriate utilization. Um, I just can't tell you how many of PCORI's um, uh, publications now turn out to be more patient-centered and in the process of getting the care right the first time, downstream utilization goes down. The big question is, who cares? Do healthcare systems really care about this? So, um, uh, and I think if you are at a place like Kaiser Permanente, where I came from, or if you're at the VA, you will probably be interested in those findings. But uh, the, the, if you are in systems that are still predominantly uh, making their money and their revenues, keeping their people employed, on a volume-based reimbursement model, and most people tell me that that's still the vast majority of American healthcare, the incentives are just not yet there to change. So the research question would be, if we are moving away from fee-for-service and volume-based reimbursement, what are we moving toward? How far do we have to move? Is there anything that is gonna truly be effective in incorporating this evidence about how you can reduce wasteful utilization between fee-for-service at one end um, uh, and uh, strong risk, substantial risk sharing on the other, are there tipping points at which organizational or system behavior actually begin to change to become more supportive of uh, prudent evidence-based care? So here possible solutions would be, and most of these I'll admit are um, on the um, plate of researchers themselves to propose these, ARC, foundations, to some extent PCORI to fund these, but study the range of value-based purchasing arrangements to compare them to more extreme risk sharing, always the question being in terms of clinical outcomes and patient satisfaction as well as cost saving. Do some of these milder versions in these real world settings we still face actually have the anticipated hope for effects? Study successful models of greater risk sharing, such as one that really intrigues me are bundling and paying for care for all patients with a condition, not just that subgroup that has already been referred for a costly pursued procedure or has already experienced a costly complication. Study the range of possible incentives and cultural changes at the organizational level and the individual provider level that could identify those types of incentives that are associated with positive changes in costs and use. Study the drivers of high unit, high unit costs for services, in-hospital services versus outpatient services. Why do they differ so much? help the world understand and help uh, patients understand why things cost two to three times as much often in the U.S. as elsewhere, and in some settings in the U.S. versus others. And lastly, continue to build this evidence, and this is probably mostly where PCORI comes in, that more patient-centered care, more thoughtful care can actually improve patient outcomes 
clinical outcomes while reducing utilization and associated costs. Those studies are out there to be done. And although it may feel like you're banging your head against the wall, the, as the evidence continues to grow, as the environment is filled with the understanding that, you know, limit endless utilization and costs is not the only way, I think that it will change the dialogue and begin to change minds. And um, again, as I said, this latter type of patient-centered research is probably more where, where, where Corey can be helpful. So I will uh, turn it to the uh, next panelist. I believe that is uh, Gopal Khanna from ARC. Yes, Unless thank Michael you wants to intervene. No, no, Gopal, um, go, go for it with your five minutes. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thanks again to NAM for carrying out this study and for the report, as well as Academy Health Support for this incredible effort. Uh, you've given all of us a great deal to think about. Um, today's webinar is really a terrific opportunity to discuss the issues raised in the report, ones uh, that Michael, you, and Carol, and Lisa, and Joe have uh, so nicely framed for us. <clears throat> As we look ahead, we need to take into consideration the changes and disruption in the entire healthcare ecosystem and society at large as well. What we are seeing is an unprecedented realignment in healthcare delivery systems due to mergers and acquisitions, increasing volume, variety, and velocity of data flowing into and through healthcare, demographic changes, and the pressures resulting from an aging population. And of course, the growing impact of technology, internet of things, and digital of everything. For us at ARC Healthcare Services Research, along with practice improvement and data and analytics is one of our three core competencies. We, we take the, the findings of this report very seriously. Actually, I can't make this next point strongly enough. And if there's one message I want to emphasize, it's this. ARC, as a leading funder of HSR, must drive the field to become even more responsive to its end users, health systems leaders, and healthcare professionals, physicians, and clinicians. The ones who put HSR findings into practice to improve the lives of patients. We must adopt a consumer-driven approach to research. The field must start thinking of healthcare professionals along with patients as our customers. We must focus on what health systems need to improve care and design research on that basis. The research community needs to understand their pain points because delivery systems are the engine of healthcare improvement. As a funder, ARC must improve how we guide the field, including rethinking our approach to ensure that research outputs are more directly usable in the delivery of patient care. Uh, to this end, by the way, ARC, at ARC, I have begun hosting roundtable meetings with CEOs and health systems leaders to better understand their needs and how ARC can produce research that will drive change. Additionally, I see two other important priorities for the field of HSR emerging that are contained in this report that I would like to highlight. First, we must continue to expand the amount and type of data available for research. We must develop data sources and put in place processes to give researchers unlimited access to data that matches the inputs required for consumer-driven, transdisciplinary, whole-person research. This means expanding upon narrowly defined data typically used for HSR more limitless data sources. At ARC, we are already working to expand the data included in both HCUP and MEPS and make them more easily available to health systems and health services researchers. Second, HSR must evolve and must involve other research disciplines. As we move towards care of the whole person, the research community needs to think about how to take a multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach to research. Research teams should more systematically include the social and behavioral sciences, healthcare informatics, and public health disciplines to have a more well-rounded approach. 
to provide care for the whole person, researchers need to consider all of the factors that influence a person's health status. You see, we cannot fund innovative health systems research if we do not receive innovative investigator-initiated applications. I strongly encourage researchers to consider the recommendations of this report and incorporate them into their research teams, research designs, and research applications. I and my colleagues at ARC will be listening closely as the field responds to the recommendations of this report. We look forward to continuing to be partners with the HSR community, healthcare delivery systems leaders, and clinicians, as well as health policymakers at the national, state, and local level, so that together we can expand the timeliness and impact of HSR. Once again, Michael, thank you so very much for including me in this conversation, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Gopal, um, for reminding us of the importance of the issues, the commitment of ARC uh, to uh, lead uh, progress, uh, and the rapid pace of change that accentuates the importance of our strengthening the field. Um, now we're going to turn to uh, Tim Ferris uh, from Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, thank you, Mike, um, and, and uh, thanks to uh, the team who's, who's put this together. Um, I'm very pleased to provide a, a few comments regarding uh, my, my thoughts on this um, and, and felt very honored to be part of this process. Um, I, I characterize uh, health services research um, uh, uh, broadly, and this is, a, of course, an oversimplification uh, into uh, things that have HSR has done really well, uh, give, give an A grade to, things they've done pretty well, give a B grade to, and, and things in the past that so we haven't done well that I think we should do better in the future. And I, I would say I would give an A grade to HSR's ability to provide point estimates on deficiencies in the delivery of healthcare. Um, the, those, the, the, the many, many studies that have provided um, concrete information of deficiencies with precise point estimates ha have been remarkably important for changing policy and, and addressing issues through a whole host of um, uh, specific uh, healthcare issues and, and really has been instrumental, as um, Lisa pointed out in her remarks, in uh, major changes in our system. I would say um, uh, health services research gets, gets more of a B grade from me on uh, policy development from evidence. Uh, it's, it's challenging to, uh, to translate evidence into policy. Um, and, um, and, and I would say, it, 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 uh, again, to, to some of the, um, my predecessors on, the, on this uh, webinar, um, we, there's room to do a, a better job there. But I would say, uh, particularly as um, a manager in a delivery system, um, I, I would give health services research a, a C or maybe even a D on the usefulness um, to the delivery system of uh, what is mostly being produced in health services research. And I want to uh, focus on the, uh, some of these, um, uh, some of the things that I think we have to overcome. Uh, in the future on this third point. Um, so how can we improve on usefulness going forward? Well, I think there are three uh, issues, at, at least three, um, but I'll, I'll just mention three, um, that, that are, are pretty substantial barriers to um, uh, getting useful information out of health services research for managers. The first one is, um, uh, you know, our methods for assigning causality um, uh, are, are, um, uh, are difficult. Um, uh, it's difficult to assign causality to a particular intervention uh, it, when in real life, uh, in the delivery of healthcare, there's a lot of variables changing at once. And, and similar to uh, clinical trials where there's a criticism of clinical trials because they're not um, uh, in, um, they're not generalizable to the real world. I, I think the same holds true in health services research, and, and I think we need to um, uh, in much health services research, and I think we need to address that. 
The second is, um, again, it's, a, it's, it's the use of standard epidemiologic methods applied in health services research. But, you know, healthcare delivery is uh, most often not like a pill and that the exposure uh, to the um, intervention in a pill is uh, quite, is measurable and generally quite constant or controllable. That is generally not true in, in delivery improvements. Um, and, uh, and yet we adhere to the same um, uh, standards for evidence um, uh, when we know that, that the exposure uh, to the delivery is highly variable in a complex system. Um, and, um, and how we're going to incorporate this, um, this problem. And I, I just want to drill into this one more layer and say that in the real world, managers who are implementing changes are not going to and tend not to hold an exposure constant just to let the, the, um, the experiment play out. In fact, if they see that the uh, exposure is um, uh, limited in some way, they're going to make changes. So they're in the real world, you're, we're making continuous changes to improve. And that um, uh, uh, runs up against this um, epidemiologic standard that um, is so pervasive. And, and I think uh, that will need to be um, addressed. And the third is um, uh, what I would uh, refer to as the um, possibly premature or the the, um, the time frame over which results are uh, often published. I get there's a push to publish uh, early results, but making changes in the delivery of services um, is a generally a, a, a multi-year process, and uh, especially at the scale of the kinds of changes like um, uh, finance changes, what, what Joe um, uh, Selby was talking about. And so, um, uh, I, we've seen uh, press coverage of early results uh, where it, it actually um, does a disservice to the efforts of change when, um, uh, when in fact the time frame over which uh, real change occurs hasn't been allowed to um, play out. And that tension is, um, is I think, uh, a, a, an issue in health services research for, for the delivery of health services for, to, to the managers of delivery systems. So I'll, um, uh, I, I think we have to overcome these um, uh, various challenges and, and I, um, I look forward to the next generation of health services researchers uh, finding ways to uh, uh, overcome them. And I'll um, uh, close there on my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, um, especially for identifying uh, some of the barriers that need to be engaged, the challenges that need to be engaged, many of which uh, are in fact, uh, uh, were in fact addressed in the course of the conversation during the meeting and uh, reported in the publication. Uh, so you're underscoring them as all the more important. And it also draws attention to the changing tools available as we move to a real world evidence continuous learning modality and the advent of uh, application of AI and machine learning and so forth. Um, and now we're going to turn to uh, Mary Applegate, who has a, a, a special challenge because it looks like she's going to have about um, 30 seconds for each slide that she's going to show. But Mary, um, you're going to tell us the story from the front line and we look forward to it. Yes, uh, thank you. I do want to thank Academy Health as well as uh, the National Academy for allowing me to present a state view uh, of uh, what we may need uh, as uh, an end user for health services research. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so I'm just gonna cover four uh, topics and actually I have visuals that go with this, so don't actually panic. I'd like to suggest that uh, with measures, we can do cross-state benchmarking and we can leverage a distributed research network to actually accelerate our understanding of what's going on in different states and why. Uh, so I think there's opportunity to get out of our, our little box of a uh, largely single entity of subspecialists and really together work at population health outcomes. Next, as was referenced earlier, uh, in the value-based purchasing arena, lots of 
uh, assumptions have not been tested. And so you see states trying to contain costs without really good evidence. And this actually may be part of why the policymakers uh, aren't honoring uh, as much of the evidence that exists uh, because we haven't been able to be in front of what is actually needed. Uh, we must get comfortable with measures that are good enough and not perfect, and we actually can't wait three to five years to get them. Uh, next, I'd like to suggest harnessing IT, as earlier speakers mentioned, and I'm, I'll give you an example of predictive analytics at the point of service. And lastly, to Lisa Simpson's comments, uh, the Medicaid agency in particular is very tuned in to social determinants of health, and it could be that the models of care that we've uh, developed do not sufficiently honor the impact of health and outcomes as it relates to social determinants of health. Next slide. What I show you here is an example from our SUPLIN, the State University Partnership um, Learning Network, which is anchored, I'd say, primarily at the University of uh, Pittsburgh. And you see several of the participating states, which are largely in the Midwest. And what you see is a population view of the percent of Medicaid recipients that are affected by opioid use disorder. And you'll, you'll note at the bottom that we have a couple of different data definitions and the results are slightly different. Uh, so just the whole idea of measures informing uh, this, just the state of the universe and, and then in the next graph comparing, uh, for example, those who are receiving medication assisted treatment for those who have opioid use disorder. And what you can see here is that state E who has the lowest uh, prevalence of opioid use disorder also has the lowest uh, uptake of medication assisted treatment, but you'll also notice that there's perhaps a two, two-fold difference. And so evaluating the state's uh, policies and implementation uh, may be important, but having this kind of benchmarking so that we're looking to other states and researchers uh, for effective um, interventions is likely an untapped resource moving forward. Next slide. An earlier speaker talked about other sources of data. This is data from our prescription drug monitoring program. And you'll see on the left three states, and we have uh, the, uh, the number of patients per 100,000 population receiving opioids. What you can see at the bottom is that uh, Kentucky looked like the best out of all three of our states, but Ohio, which is the red light, improved the fastest. So again, benchmarking against states is helpful because we also have to manage what's happening around our borders. Uh, so contiguous states are particularly interested. In the, on the graph on the right, what you see are opioid naive patients who are then giving long acting opioids for acute pain. Uh, so you'll see there's wide variation across states and, and really digging into uh, policies and how Medicaid programs implement those policies becomes important in helping the entire country move forward. Uh, so uh, to that point about generalizability, there's so much variation across states that working together, I think, can accelerate improvements on behalf of the country. So a focus on, on a national agenda and a national foundation of health services research, uh, to me, is actually quite important. Next slide. What you see here is uh, an attempt uh, for us to identify safe opioid prescribing, again, uh, addressing a, a national and state public health issue and pulling it into the mainstream of how we pay for care day in and day out. So this is a, a different idea, but in the end, you know, we've been paying for care in a fee-for-service way for decades, and then we point to public health and say, oh yeah, obesity, smoking, drug use is your problem. And you know, they're largely grant funded. So uh, I would challenge um, that that's not likely the best way to uh, improve the health of our population across the country. So here I have four different episodes of care that we've done, and what I show you is the Ohio median for new opioid prescriptions for these procedures, as well as the 25th and the 75th percentile. And the idea here is that in order to be eligible for gain sharing, you must pass a threshold, be better than the median, for example, um, uh, you know, on key quality metrics. And this is a metric that we developed because the existing measure for opioids is way too high, over 120 morphine equivalents. Uh, and then we didn't necessarily have a, a new opioid prescription uh, measure. So what has happened is because we don't have the measures that we need to put into managed care plan contracts or to uh, put money behind in value-based purchasing, states have actually needed to develop their own measures, which then creates the problem of not having a uniform set across the country. So uh, at least with our university partnership, we have eight states who are, are looking at some of the same measures. So that's a positive step forward. On the next slide, what I show is 
uh, this is in the Behavioral Health Universe, and I apologize as I blew this up, the arrows don't quite match. Uh, but one of the ideas in value-based purchasing is as long as patients with behavioral health conditions get seen every month, they get a monthly payment. So this is an alternative to fee-for-service. And along the middle, you see someone who's getting buprenorphine or methadone, you see all those pink, those pink dots. And then above it, you see all the green dots, which means they have an office visit. This is some, somebody who is adherent to medication-assisted treatment and psychosocial services. So if you see that, you realize you're taking good care of your population in an evidence-based way, that evidence -based way that actually could be in real time. The only comment I have here is that bottom line of all the blue dots, those are urine drug tests. So that does not look like a random pattern, uh, which is the best evidence. But at least they're showing up for care. Uh, lower down, you see um, all these green big dots, and those are inpatient stays that then have gaps afterwards. So this is somebody who is very ill, lost a follow-up, coming back, and ultimately had an overdose. And then farther down, um, just visually, if you see a white spot, that may be somebody who either got better or who's lost a follow-up. And when we bring that directly to attention in real time to the clinician, their actions they can take. Um, so I just like to suggest that that data and uh, measures with real-time feedback can be not useful, not just useful in patient outcomes, but very useful in value-based purchasing. Uh, next up, I want to give you an example of uh, predictive modeling. So I won't re read through this whole case, but the category is infant mortality. And everything in red are risk factors that we've actually built into a model that actually showed um, that it was relevant. We did all this logistic regression work. And I'll show you the math on the next slide. So all of these risk factors translate into this equation. Next slide. Which then comes up with a real math probability of infant mortality for this patient. Um, Next slide. What we can do with all of those variables is uh, populate it into a screen that looks something like this. And then what comes out of it is on the next slide, which essentially is a speedometer. So if you take your pregnant person, change one variable, smoking, non-smoking, you can actually see what happens to the risk of infant mortality going from almost 46% you know, uh, down to 39%. We could make a, uh, a twin app for this that the patient could have that then is connected to programming specifically designed for behavior change, like smoking cessation, uh, which then can be, connected, can be connected to payer incentives. So if they finish their smoking cessation module, they may be eligible for free diapers for X number of months, for example. So this is one way to see the, the real impact at the patient level with patient engagement that was referenced earlier and connected to how we pay for care. Uh, lastly, I will just mention on the next slide where we have information in the system. We have all kinds of information related to health conditions, biology, physiology, when we all recognize that social determinants of health is the heavyweight in your outcome. So uh, to the earlier uh, speaker's comments, if we can work with partners who have different kinds of information and figure out a way to, to leverage this to really cut to the chase of what's driving poor outcomes, that would be helpful. On this slide, you see Ohio's example of the public sources of information that we have put into an opportunity index that we have then mapped. Next slide. And what this shows us is how uh, the opportunity indices actually change over a period of time. We are intended, this allows us then to talk about the dynamic structural underpinnings as opposed to just speaking about race. So for us, this is a strategy to get to equity. Uh, and end disparities and outcomes. Um, the other piece here is that we will be overlaying this with uh, readmissions and episodes of care as well as comprehensive primary care to actually see if our risk adjustment is done properly or accurately. Uh, some of those uh, mechanisms for payment may simply highlight uh, under-resourced families as opposed to anything specific related to the healthcare system. Uh, so we do have to get to fairness. Uh, so with that, I think I'd like to uh, thank all of you, but encourage us all to think about creating the future that we would actually like to see. And I do think that harnessing technology is absolutely uh, one of the most promising paths forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for a vision, uh, an inspiring vision of uh, what might be possible uh, with respect to cutting edge health services research. Uh, and now we're going to turn to Eleanor uh, Perfetto. Thank you, Michael, and thank you uh, to you and to Danielle and the other organizers. Uh, I really appreciate being asked to be here today. And being the last speaker of the panel, I have the 
disadvantage in that many of the things that I um, am going to talk about have already been in some context mentioned, and so it may be a little bit repetitive, but I also have the advantage in being able to summarize what everyone else said um, in the way that I'd like to summarize it. So um, I'm going to jump in and try to bring back, bring us back to something that I think is, is really important in this conversation, and that's the patient perspective. And um, I think we, we all have come to know and understand that patient centricity and patient engagement in research is, is no longer a novelty. It's not um, restricted. To the research that's funded by PCORI, um, thanks to Joe and his colleagues and their work over the last nine plus years, it's now very commonplace to have the expectation that um, patients will be engaged in research. And so uh, it's one of the things that I, I want to uh, uh, bring home that point in terms of health services research. It doesn't really um, matter what the study objective is or what the research design is in all forms of health research it's become very expected that patients should be engaged, not as study subjects, but as uh, research par uh, partners. And, um, and I think we've seen that more and more. Um, for example, we're seeing um, in, in randomized controlled trials for medical product development, um, more and more involvement of patients in that process. And to the, it's to the point where we see that the FDA is now preparing numerous guidance documents uh, because this has become such ex uh, uh, an accepted and expected pra practice. Um, since health services research covers access, quality, cost, value, all of the topics that the previous speakers have touched upon, um, it's, these are topics that are of critical importance to the patient community. And when I talk about the patient community, I mean patients, caregivers, as well as patient advocacy organizations. Um, these are topics that they care uh, a great deal about um, that, that are important to their everyday um, living and survival. And so they need to be involved from start to finish in the study question formulation, design, and dissemination. Um, I think that we need to really uh, have that become more part of the uh, everyday of health services research. And I, I think it has become much more of the everyday, but I think we can do even a, an even better job um, we've had a number of recent conversations on a new project that we've been working on where we are talking to researchers who really are um, health services researchers who specifically focus on things like claims data analysis, real world evaluations, and um, have been talking to them about how they can use patient input in their work. And we've had some remarkable conversations where they've, where they've honestly said, gee, I never thought about it before. But now that you raise the issue, um, it's something that I think I could uh, easily incorporate into the process that they go through in their research. And one key example was on a database analysis of claims data, um, looking at patients with um, atrial fibrillation. And, um, and then and speaking to patients directly and hearing about their experience with their disease and realizing that so many of them had uh, been either misdiagnosed or had had a difficult time getting diagnosed and that it took anywhere from several years to sometimes seven to 10 years for these individuals to get an accurate diagnosis. And that if the analysis began looking at the individual from the first day that a claim was seen with a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, um, that, that the researcher would be missing that those individuals had actually had symptoms and issues going on for at least several years before, and it would change the framing of the analysis. And so it's those kinds of examples that really bring home the point that um, engaging patients and having a good understanding of their patient journey and their experiences with their illness can really add rigor to every type of analysis in health services research. So for my, my suggested steps, to accomplishing patient centricity in health services research is um, for us to continue to educate researchers on and incentivize them to embrace patient engagement in health services research, incentivize them in terms of um, having the expectation that that be part of funding proposals, um, be part of dissemination planning. Um, and so we, we really need to have that um, be um, helping to bring this to the attention of the researchers and the funding agencies that are out there. Um, and then also to develop and disseminate case examples of patient engagement in health services research to highlight the patient's role, their contribution, and the impact that they've had um, on the research and, and with the idea that um, it, it will be very beneficial in terms of having findings that are important to patients but also um, 
are, are, are more meaningful and are uh, and have clarity to the clinicians who would be using that research and the policymakers who will be using that research. And I just want to touch upon one thing that Mary was talking about when she was talking about the social determinants of health. I think this is so critically important for the patient community to have the, the context um, that they that they live in with their illness to be well understood as part of the research process, but then it also helps us to translate that into the context of care delivery and really doing a better job of personalizing care management for those individuals when we understand the, the true circumstances of, of their experiences and their journey, uh, which of course uh, ref is reflected in social determinants of health. Um, so I'll, I'll end there and, um, and uh, go to the Q&A session. Thank you very much, uh, Eleanor, and, and all of you for uh, laying out really beautifully uh, the key issues that uh, and opportunities that are ahead. We're now going to move to a Q&A session. We have about 15 minutes, and our facilitator uh, for that will be Dr. Danielle Witcher. Danielle? Thank you, Michael, and thank you to all of the speakers. This has been a, a, a great uh, series of presentations. Um, we're going to start out with a question for Carolyn Clancy. The question is, what challenges does the VA face in conducting needed work? And how can the veteran and military advocates in the health field assist in furthering the VA's mission? Carolyn, are you there? We, we may have lost Carolyn or she's on mute. So, so let's, um, let's go to the next one and we loop back with Carolyn. Great. So the next question is for Mary Applegate. Uh, Mary, can you please give us an example of artificial intelligence that you have seen adding value to primary care? Thank you for the question. I'm not sure that I have an example that we're actually using currently, but I think what can happen is that uh, picture with all of the dots that I showed you are essentially patient profiles. And as more patients get seen, we can refine the patient profiles. Uh, to better than be able to predict who might actually be lost to follow-up. And I would argue that uh, we have to include social determinants of health information, uh, but all of the clinicians will tell you uh, certain key things like the loss of a key relationship or a job or other sorts of things actually may weigh into that. But that would be one example in which the more we use uh, the analytic tools, the, the better they get, and then the expanded use uh, we might be able to derive from them. Thank you, Mary. Um, we'll direct the next question to Joe Selby. Uh, Joe, so uh, the question is, we know the practitioner-centered, uh, patient-centered approach is what's needed. Why is this work still so undervalued? What if we flip the hierarchy? And what if we prioritize HSR research over uh, the laboratory-based preclinical work that we know often fails because it is uninformed by reality? Well, um, thanks, Danielle. Thanks for the question. Uh, you know, being at this end of the spectrum, along with the with the questioner, it probably is tempting to go there. But um, uh, you know, I think you only have to look at the uh, increasing longevity and and the, the treatments for diseases that uh, used to be uniformly lethal, and we all have friends who probably have benefited from those. So, um, and we got to create a, a research world where, where both are, are funded. We don't uh, don't probably need to completely flip the funding. I wouldn't disagree that that more attention needs to be placed on this. And I think we're historically at a time when more attention will be if we can produce research that, in fact, not only has interesting findings but supports systems in changing practice and leading to better outcomes. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think we will continue to fight for, uh, you know, funding of this kind of research and the survival of the agencies that fund it uh, and um, uh, hope that uh, our best efforts can uh, help to, um, you know, persuade those who make decisions about funding allocations that this is also important. And I will just say that uh, as PCORI's results have started to come out, they are well received and they are well received on the hill as, as well as elsewhere. So it's, um, you know, we just, we, we need to do some of the things that have been said on the phone here today. 
uh, and try to always bend our research towards answering relevant questions and changing practice. Danielle, this is Lisa. If I could just build on Joe's answer, um, I, and especially um, given who asked the question, I think it's critically important for that the uh, messengers who see the value in health services research to address um, patient needs and community needs are also vocal in their support for this work. So as eloquent as Joe and Gopal and others are, and, and we at Academy Health work hard to uh, articulate the value of investing federal uh, dollars in health services research. Um, what is most powerful in communicating that message is hearing from the end users, the, the patient groups, uh, the health systems, those who are in the, you know, in the business of receiving or delivering care. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Lisa. Would any of the other panelists like to uh, weigh in on this question? Okay, so we will move on to uh, a related question, and um, maybe uh, we can direct this one to uh, Mary. Um, there is a, the question is, there is an assumption that evidence should inform policy. What if policymakers were more explicit about what it is that they needed to know? In other words, Policymakers could set goals and articulate challenges and empower the research community to determine the knowledge needed to address the challenge challenges. So that's an interesting question, kind of turns things on its head. I, I think what I see is from policymakers is they get a little nugget of information that may have some evidence, and then they'll say things like, uh, we want to, you know, triple or quadruple the children getting home visits. And so in, in my mind, uh, the question that I have back to them is, which measures are you most interested in moving for children? Is this about pregnancy outcomes, infant mortality, school readiness, uh, literacy, uh, because not all home visiting programs uh, were de designed the same, and certainly all the evidence is actually not the same either. So um, oftentimes what happens is they work on state and other budget cycles that are very short, so there's not enough runway, there's not enough lead time to be able to accomplish that. So what they would like to see are results within a couple years or at least in a couple years beyond a trajectory that actually is clearly an improvement. So I don't think it's too much to ask for the health research community to fast forward and, and think about what, what would you need to pay for better value care three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. So to me, it's actually clear. I, I think this group has articulated. Uh, we have not included the social determinants of health uh, adequately. We, and, and truthfully, those entities do not have the skill set necessarily. They're not necessarily data people if they're in a homeless shelter. So, so I think us getting outside of our offices and showing up and saying, you know what, your work really matters. Would you allow us to help you with, with data collection? You know, that's not necessarily a conversation that actually happens. So I actually think um, investment in prevention would be an interesting piece. That, that is what we want. And then actually looking at other sites of care like schools. Children have to go to school. So why not leverage what could work in schools and then let Medicaid and payers figure out uh, payment mechanisms since we can't necessarily expect an education dollar to go for a health outcome. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question and uh, worth additional discussion. Wonderful, thank you, Mary. Um, Tim, I'd like to turn things over to you and see if you had any uh, any thoughts about that question as well. Um, well, I'm in complete agreement. I, I think the, the 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 work we're doing here, using our combination of clinical data, claims um, from a roughly one million population covered lives um, in our delivery system. And um, and creative use of socioeconomic data. Um, we are just to, to give you a sense of uh, a, a complementing the comments you just heard. Um, we now our clinicians can see um, geo maps of um, the zip code regions of their patients differentially that show where we are, for example. Um, not doing as well on hemoglobin A1C or blood pressure control. Um, it's that specific. And then 
we as a health system are allocating resor extra resources in those areas because the 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 uh, the improvement processes that work in a well-resourced neighborhood are really quite different than the improvement processes in an under-resourced neighborhood. And so we as a health system seeking to have equally high quality across them um, actually have to not only you know, have the data to show it, but, but also tailor our interventions. That's a level of specificity that I couldn't have guessed we'd be doing five years ago. And it's all um, uh, based on the fact that we now have the three critical forms of data and can merge them in, uh, in as uh, Lisa was saying earlier, the computing power necessary to do the, this work is, is now easy to come by. Um, and so I, I completely agree with the other panelists about this is, a, this is where things are heading and it, I think it's quite exciting. Wonderful. Thank you, Tim. Any other comments from the other panelists? Sure, Danielle, this is Lisa. I wanted to add to, to both Mary and Tim's comments about, you know, how do we flip this uh, model on its head and have policymakers drive the agenda? Well, I think we need to consider what are the, what's the current incentive structure for researchers? And they are not incentivized or rewarded for doing work that is relevant to policymakers. They are incentivized by a traditional academic uh, health system that is driven by uh, federal funding for research uh, that has historically emphasized new and uh, unique um, uh, questions that advance an individual uh, career in research uh, and, and promotion and tenure. I'm oversimplifying, but the reality is that various efforts have been made to understand the priorities and information needs of policymakers. At Academy Health, we created listening reports where we actually asked um, state leaders about their information needs uh, for the next three to five years, because that's the window, as, as Mary said, for research needs. Um, but again, uh, that's just, uh, unless we align the incentives just like we are trying to do for providers and care, unless we align the incentives for research, uh, we are going to continue to have this gap, this uh, chasm between uh, policymakers, health system leaders, and what researchers are focusing on. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, we'll turn to Gopal for the next question. The question is, we would, uh, I would love to hear the panelists' thoughts about data liberation. That is, how can we continue to garner higher co cooperation from healthcare delivery systems, insurers, and other stakeholders to share data that can enable the important and complex cross-system and cross-state analyses? <laughs> Um, Paul, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, yes, Lisa. Uh, sorry, Danielle. That's a uh, that's a very good question. I think recognizing the power of data and, and its uh, its usability and inevitability in the system uh, for not just disruption, causing disruption, but also the opportunity for improvement is is huge. So now the question before us is how do we collaborate on all frontiers. It is not just uh, <clears throat> being able to work with the states and local governments uh, in terms of uh, their data needs and how we can bring their data. And that's where, that's where uh, our uh, leveraging our MEPS and HCUP uh, data sources uh, plays a very critical and useful role in being able to link some to some of those uh, that data that sits there. Uh, and and create new ways of looking at uh, uh, data from a policy making perspective, but also making it available to the researchers. Now, there's another dimension to the data use and and uh, in treating the power of uh, of what's uh, possible with its use is the learning health system, uh, and and trying a way to not only uh, look at the EHR, but also seeing how other data can be used to, to provide new perspectives and help the, the systems leaders to, to, uh, to move 
the needle on uh, on learning health systems in their own enterprises. So the 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 challenge is going to be accessibility and uh, and availability of data. Naturally, there are many barriers, uh, HIPAA being one and uh, and others. So it's just that data resides all over. But over a period of time, I envision and I see uh, more and more data being liberated. And therefore, the, the opportunity is for us to, all the players, by the way, in the field to, to, uh, to take advantage and do more of data sharing as and where it is possible. Danielle? Hi, Joe. Yes, would you like to, we were going to ask you if you'd like to weigh in on that as well. Uh, Yes, good. I mean, I wondered if that question was a plant from somebody on the planning committee for one of the next NAM meetings, where, uh, which is um, entitled Building Stakeholder Demand for um, uh, Data. And, you know, right now, patients themselves can't get their own data, which is a, is a huge challenge. And certainly, the, uh, the questioner's issue um, experience probably is the same as ours that there is so much inertia and there are so many barriers to getting data shared for the greatest and, and for the IRB approved uh, research questions so and and but when researchers ask for it I think that there's a tendency in many institutions to be just a little suspect uh, and if you've ever sit on IRBs you know the suspicion that 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 um, sits there so um, this is about trying to get again patients and other others who um, maybe haven't really weighed in yet on the importance of liberating data, both for individual decision making, but for research as well. So we uh, hope to have a, a meeting in uh, June. It's planning is underway. Critical question. Um, people have been trying to do it for years. The novel novel approach here is that perhaps if patients themselves and their caregivers are demanding it. Um, that may uh, add a new um, uh, pressure to the uh, to, to work against the inertia. This Thank is you, Tim. Can I so jump Danielle, in on that? This is Carolyn. Could I just add one quick thing? I mean, I think this all uh, converges on a point that many of the presenters made about a getting the question right and b um, working with users of the research. If a researcher pr approaches, or even a research funder approaches a healthcare organization and says, gosh, uh, could you liberate your data, please? And uh, by the way, we don't want to pay much for it. Um, you know, th th this is not going to be what you would call a successful conversation. I do think there's an opportunity for the academy to contemplate new ways that people are using this data, particularly in artificial intelligence, because I don't think that the boundaries of that field have been well mapped or articulated. Thank you, Carolyn. And Tim, I think you wanted to jump in as well. Well, I just wanted to, to point out um, as a, as a uh, I, I guess, a, a, a bona fide health services researcher who, who is now in management, um, it, one of the things that struck me to Joe's comment about liberating data is um, I have an enormous amount of data assets at my fingertips, um, m much more than I can handle, actually. And, and it, it, it actually, I have actually no barriers to, um, to using that data however I want. The barrier comes in uh, when the, you, you switch the frame. So my analytic approach as a manager might be, exactly what I would do as a health services researcher. But as soon as I um, want to publish it, it, it changes the game substantially. Um, and I think that is, um, that's, that's another one of these barriers. Um, th there's a lot of data and analytics going on in the management of health services that, that doesn't see the light of day. I, I know there are methods to um, liberate those analyses. We were talking about, Joe was talking about liberating the data. I'm liberating the data has some challenges, but liberating the analyses is, I think, uh, less challenging, but has its own set of issues. And I, I think there is um, uh, a, a lot of work going on that remains unpublished and unavailable t to people who could use it. Um, and, and that is another um, uh, seam in this health services mine that should um, be examined. 
Thank you, Tim. And again, thank you to all of our speakers. This has been a, a really fabulous uh, conversation. Um, thank you also to everyone who tuned in. We received many, many questions for our panelists, um, and I'm sorry that we were unable to get through them all, but um, we'd love to keep the conversation going. And in that vein, I'll uh, turn things over to Michael McGinnis to uh, close out the webinar. Well, it'll be a very quick close um, uh, uh, and not nearly enough time to do justice to the richness of the uh, conversation and uh, even more importantly, the significance of the issue. We've heard a lot about the fact that there's a small, a very small percentage of research funding that goes to health services research or in the, as the uh, publication indicates, health systems research. Uh, as costs increase, as complexity in diagnosis and treatment increases, as the tools available to us uh, increase, uh, tools like geocoding, AI, and ML, as the tailoring tools we have uh, improve, the importance of health services research, as has been indicated by our panelists, becomes uh, critical. So uh, we really appreciate all the work that uh, our panelists uh, have done. Uh, and Intelligence and wisdom they brought to this conversation. As Danielle mentioned, uh, we uh, are treating this as an ongoing uh, set of interactions. So please, if you uh, have questions or suggestions that you feel should be on the agenda, send them to us. Uh, and uh, the webinar recording will be made available at nam.edu backslash HSR. So thanks to all and to be continued. Bye-bye now.